Well, it's an enormous pleasure and really a big, big pleasure that we are celebrating 10 years of urban age. So I really want to thank Ricky Burdett, the London School of Economics across years that have all supported this fantastic project. It is really sui generis. I don't know of anything like it. But now I'm going to start with my uh, lecture. Um, so the city, I want to, I want to, I'm going to show you a few negative aspects of cities today. And so to frame that, I want to start with what I think of cities. What, what is it about cities that matters so much today? So a first feature is that cities are really complex but incomplete systems. And given that mix, they have managed to outlive all kinds of more powerful actors, which however are formal and closed, maybe complex, but closed. Think of most corporations that have ever been invented. They're gone. But the cities where they were, they're still here. When you look at cities that way, then you must say, okay, here is a particular kind of systematicity that actually is very interesting, that contains capabilities. A second feature is that I think of the city as a space where those without power get to make a history, a culture, an economy, a neighborhood economy. In other words, a space where powerlessness can become complex. They don't necessarily become empowered, but their powerlessness can become complex. And in that sense, they can make. It's a space where they can make. And then finally, I think of the city as a, as a sort of frontier zone. When I ask myself, where is today's frontier? I think it's in cities. It might also be in a few places where you have you know, massive mining expansion and land grabs and you have encounters with indigenous people. But it's not like the frontier as we knew it you know, in, in, in our imperial epoch. And the frontier, one definition of the frontier space is that it is a space where actors from different worlds have an encounter for which there are no established rules of engagement. Now, in the past, that meant very often that we just slaughtered them or we took whatever they had. But today, in the city, it's a highly intermediated encounter. And so the city is also a space where power, which has increasingly become very abstract, very intermediated, actually hits the ground one moment in its trajectory, in its often global trajectory. And it becomes men and women who want it all and get it all and thereby leave a huge footprint. They make power, which is today, I repeat, so intermediated and elusive, they actually give it a very concrete moment. And having grown up in Argentina, the, the sort of the fighting poor have this wonderful phrase, estamos presentes. We're present. We're not asking you for anything, power. We are here, that's all. So the city enables those without power to have that position, to sort of say, you know what? The city is also mine. And those three features, I mean, one could list a few more, but let me just stick with those three. They mark for me a possibility, a set of capabilities, you know, a lot of positives. So what I turn to next is some of the main features that are happening in some of our major cities. I'm actually working with a data set of 100 cities, and these 100 cities are classified in terms of the, 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 they are the leading 100 cities in terms of foreign investment. So I'm not going to show you the full 100 cities because it just would be a list that goes all over. So I'll just show you a few. And so the main issue here really is a kind of buying of urban land that I think represents a major threat to those particular features of cities that have enabled cities to have long lives and that have enabled those without power to actually feel that this is also my city. So those are sort of the, the critical concerns within which I want to situate a lot of the data that I'm showing you, all right? So, so there is a broader framing here. So if this is just a few, 
But very quickly, I don't want to dwell too much. There isn't a lot of time. So these are the top 10. This is total uh, foreign and national investment. This is a story that begins in 2008. I mean, it had older versions. But really, what I'm talking about, right, it's a whole new phase. Begins in 2008, the crises, et cetera. And so by, this is just one year, mid-2013 to mid-2014. In that year, the top 100 cities received $600 billion just buying property. It does not include uh, site development. You know, when you buy a big piece of land and you totally redevelop it. So it's just buying property. Now, you can see that New York Metro is number one. New York likes very much always to be number one. London is number two, far more modest, not, you know. Tokyo, and you see a mix. Now, if I showed you the 100, it's an extraordinary mix of cities. So it includes also, I am Dutch, and so Amsterdam, you know, and they're in shock at what's happening there. Now, I'll, I'll develop a bit more, you know, what are the contents, et cetera, of all of this. Now, here is another way of, of looking at it. You know, you have sort of a more dramatic feature. Again, and I think the list is just a bit longer here. I don't know if you can see in the back what we're talking about, but, you know, just looking at the bar, at the once it up further down, you have Shanghai, Seattle, Miami, Beijing, Stockholm, Melbourne, Denver, Philadelphia, etc., Toronto. So it is a mix of cities. And there are quite a few American cities, and I think that is probably a function of the data gathering uh, bit, you know, that they are better documented. Now, if you only take foreign, London is number one, and a very high proportion of investment in London is foreign. And you, I think you all know the, the story, so I like to say about this, you know, and many people think that, oh my God, this is gentrification. On steroids maybe, but still. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. So this little, it's a vignette, but it is actually a truth. The Qatari royals own more of London than the Queen of England. Pace, the Queen of England, is not the main owner of London. But you know, and I don't worry about either, by the way, they're totally fine. But you know, when that happens, then if you just say, ah, this is gentrification, it's a sort of invitation not to think, not to understand, well, what am I actually witnessing here? What is happening? Now, again, here you have a, a longer list, and here, you know, if you go further down, you see Frankfurt, Seoul, Hong Kong, Barcelona, a lot of cities, including sort of mid-sized cities, are part of this story. Now, boy, I, when I wrote them on my computer, these letters, they look very tiny. Here, it's like, wow, I didn't mean it so, oof, it's beautiful, but very dramatic. White and black always works. So what does it all mean? Uh, now, what does it all look like or look like, right? So this is one example. Look what good taste. These are all Chinese acquisitions. Nothing against the Chinese, yeah, because there are many nationalities. But look at what they all bought. I don't know if people can see it from the back, but it's quite a select bit of buildings. So one has to stand back and say, good taste. Now, what else is involved? You know, that's another story. This is the, the, also a Chinese company, not such good taste. This is New York. This is a site in New York called Atlantic Yards, which actually has a mix. You know, it's sort of an underutilized. It's a huge piece of land. And, uh, and it has, you know, little factories, but, you know, little fabricators who actually feed into the architectural profession, etc. It has artist studios. It has a lot of activities that were displaced from lower Manhattan, because lower Manhattan is, you know, totally built up now. And so it is actually very nice. It's deeply urban, even though it is low density. Now, at the same time, um, this Chinese company, which bought it, this is site development, this is not property, huh? is going to erase all of that and build. The last thing I heard was 14 massive towers, luxury towers for residents. Now, that adds to the density but I argue it actually de-urbanizes, because it creates one use. It privatizes a lot of land. It eliminates little urban tissue, little streets, et cetera, et cetera. The architecture, what shall I say? 
It's uh, impressive, isn't it? I mean, it's like your own little colossus. I also adore Atlantic Yard. It's just not an elegant name, so they called it something like Pacific Yards. <laughs> you know, there is a Pacific also on the other side of the country. But um, <laughs> no, evidently, there is an old street in Brooklyn. Maybe Brooklyn always had aspirations that is, has something of the Pacific in it. I think it's an avenue. So um, now, very quickly, just to one way of wrapping up, the top 100 cities, I've only shown you a few. Uh, and this goes by property investment, just buying property, not the site development I just showed. They account for 10% of the world's population, 30% of the world's GDP, and 76% of property investment. You have to say, wow. Je me lève le chapeau. Very disturbing, people. That is what I'm really meaning. So one of the effects when you have that kind of, you know, I don't know, manipulation of land, et cetera, um, uh, is sort of the possibility of inventing whole new housing markets. And this is information I have from the Financial Times. did a very, very good study on this. So this is the so-called super prime housing market. And these are minimum prices. By now, actually, the de facto minimum price is like 100 million. Now, this is housing. What I've shown you today, uh, except for Atlantic Yards, was mostly um, uh, office buildings, etc. Now, these are the main nationalities. This is a very, this tells, each of these cities actually tells a tale about who are the main buyers. So uh, if you look at Dubai, it's quite different. You know, you can see Dubai is situated in a sort of a geography that makes it quite different from London or from Monaco, et cetera. I love this one, Shanghai. It looks like the world wants to buy a flat in Shanghai. Look at that, that's quite a mix. And Hong Kong, who wants to buy in Hong Kong? The main buyers are mainland Chinese. I find this very comic, but people mostly don't find it very comic. You realize, I mean, everybody, I mean, it's, it's like, it's a beauty. Anyhow, much to be said about each one of these. Now, as we know from London, London here is a very powerful exhibit of what's happening. So London has a lot of these properties that you know, and New York has had a bit too, are not occupied. There are now people who make it a sport in Manhattan to go stand where these new towers are, and at night, all windows are dark, or maybe one is lit. We know. Some people have bought in and are actually living in there, oh my God, and they say, I, we feel very lonely here, and they're about to check out. So this is really about buying into a city. And so I, in, in my bigger study, I'm beginning to think of, this is about buying urban land. Not just this, but I mean, all, everything that I've been showing to you. And so th the issue here also is, you know, what are the legal regimes that we have, and they vary enormously by city, that actually govern land, urban land ownership? There's a lot of ambiguity. And one of the thoughts when I think of the big property contracts that I mentioned before is to what extent the contracts are going to be shaping the elements of an emergent urban law. Where there is not much urban law, governing the notion of who owns urban land as opposed to the buildings. See, the, the UK ha has in parts of itself a very clear regime, like you may own the top, but you don't own the land actually, right? But in many cities that is not the case. So I'm doing for Habitat <coughs> a little study where I'm looking at five cities in the world, including a city like Mumbai, Joburg, that have very different ways of understanding who owns urban land. I'm also working with a lawyer, a legal scholar, who is obsessed here in London <clears throat> about this question, who owns the land in London? Not the buildings, but the land. So there is a duke who owns most of it, or a lot of it, but then there are all kinds of other. So anyhow, to me, this is, a, this is an issue that enters into the picture here. Now, these are images taken by a photographer. The name is there, I think, of The Guardian, who managed to get it into some of these mansions. And you can see, they haven't, nobody has lived there quite a while. 
I would say it takes quite a bit of time, this is another property, to get that much moss on a, on a staircase, right? So, so this is really about occupying. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, I don't know where this all goes, but you know what, for now, I'm going to grab it. It is a kind of land grab. It's not just about building new buildings. I think there, there are multiple logics that come together here. Now, another parallel history uh, is the issue of foreclosures. Foreclosure is a notice, but according to the Fed, I mean, this is, this is now about the United States. According to the Fed, our central bank, 40, when Bernanke stepped down, the former head of the Fed, he said over 14 million households have lost their homes. This is data that comes from the Federal Reserve. You know, the, the, the central banks are research institutions, besides all the other things that they do. And now, these are annual numbers. So this, these 14 million, this is about a total of 14 million, and most of them, according to the Fed, are out of their homes, either now already or very soon. And in, in sort of in, in my book, Expulsions, I sort of examine this issue in some detail, and I say, you know, what does it mean to have foreclosures on 14 million households? Well, that's about 30 million people. So my country, the Netherlands, has about 16 million people. So I'm trying to make it Pythagorean. 30 million is a big number. So it is like some voice from above says, from above the Netherlands, says, okay, everybody on the territory of the Netherlands, out. Where you go, I don't know, but out. And now we repeat the exercise. That is 30 million people. And I'm very intrigued always by, by, by how the very material, because 30 million bodies, that's a lot of materiality, huh? Materiality is used in a bit of an abstract sense, that we cannot see that. This is an imaginary geography that I'm telling you about. We can imagine 30 million people, but we actually don't see it. Huh? So it's sort of an interesting dimension. Uh, oh my God, is that the little cough that means that I have to start wrapping up? Yes? Oh no. Okay, here we go. Anyhow, so very bad stuff. And <laughs> Europe thinks it doesn't have this problem. It does, and I can't help but feel, I won't say glee, because there is a lot of suffering here, but also Germany, which has an economy that we really admire, you know, deservedly so, and, and the United Kingdom. Now, these are households, remember? The worst case in Europe right now is Hungary and Latvia. So Hungary has a million households. The data actually go on for f other years. So this is a particular kind of financial instrument. I cannot develop that, but it is an insidious way of winding up, that's not the intention hey, of the, the instrument, with a lot of empty urban space. Now, I am not trying to, this is not a conspiratorial thing that I'm saying. I'm just juxtaposing elements. And how can I not, uh, uh, instead of just talking about investments and buying, also talk about these kinds of features? Now, oh my god, this is my last slide, more or less. I'm so impressed. So why does all of this matter? I am still engaging with the big letters here. Um, well, it matters. I'm just going to invoke what I said at the beginning for all the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning, the kind of space that a city is. This kind of massive construction adds a lot of density, but actually de-urbanizes. And it sort of makes you also understand that density by itself is not enough. An office park can be very dense. Those without power can go and have a job there. But when they're done, they have to leave. They cannot, it's not like going back to their communities and having also partly a life of their own. Now the final element that I, and this is the final image, is that one of the capabilities of urban space is to generate an urban subject. An urban subject that can transcend the religious subject, the ethnic subject, the racial subject, etc. Now, the urban subject is a momentary condition, so I leave you with this last slide. This is one sort of moment of the day, rush hour, when we all become urban subjects. Thank you very much. <laughs>